<laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, a working title. Brain health coach isn't something that's really used. I mean, I've taken a couple certifications um, from places like the Amen Institute that kind of is a qualification as a brain health coach, but it's not really a, a uh, you know recognized certification. So we know that health coaching is becoming more standardized and there's boards and stuff like that. And I do have that education as well. Um, but I, I guess I'd call it a specialty. So I have training as a health coach, as a personal trainer. Um, and I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, brain health coaching requires that as a foundation. Um, and if you have that, then you just need an expertise in understanding what the research says about these different exercise, nutrition, sleep and stress management interventions. And so I'm just really working with, uh, I guess I would call them neurologically at risk populations or populations that are also called the worried well, people who are afraid of cognitive decline. And if you went to most personal trainers or health coaches with those concerns, they'd be able to tell you that exercise generally is healthy. They'd be able to tell you that good diet, sleep, and stress management are generally healthy for the brain. But they wouldn't allow you to be specific with a periodized, personalized plan like we would create for hypertrophy or weight loss or mm. power output or athletic performance. And so um, the past few years, I've just been looking at all the research and of, of what certain modalities of exercise uh, create certain outcomes and trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, currently, I'm trying to take it a step further. I'm enrolled in a Master's of Applied Neuroscience program so I can be qualified to understand about the brain, neuroanatomy, um, and hopefully have that backing of credibility to, uh, you know, when I make a recommendation, I need to understand the brain just like we need to understand actin and myosin, right? And so, uh, that's kind of what a brain health coach does, if that makes sense. And it's really creating behavioral interventions and um, lifestyle modification programs for individuals who have brain health concerns. And I would say that's everyone. Um, you know, gut health is becoming trendy or sleep coaching uh, within health coaching is becoming trendy. And I think those things are great and they play a role in brain health. But I don't think there's this perspective of I need to view health as outside the body. And truly, the brain and body are one. They're not separate. But I don't think people view the brain or cognition as a unique goal or target for these health interventions, typically. Hi, I'm Pete McCall. Welcome to episode 140 of All About Fitness. That voice you just heard was this episode's guest and returning guest, Ryan Glatt. As you heard Ryan describe, it's really hard to, dis to, to explain what he does. Right. A lot of times we look at personal trainers, we look at fitness instructors, they help our muscles look great, they help us lose weight, we exercise, and we normally think of exercise in terms of appearance. But we have to realize that exercise plays a much greater role. In fact, we're learning more and more and more about all the positive benefits of exercise. One of the things that we're learning is how exercise impacts the brain. And my guest today, Ryan Glatt, is one of the leaders in this area. As you heard Ryan describe, he can't really explain exactly what it is that he does. He's a personal trainer. He's a health coach. But his focus is on exercise and movement to improve how your brain performs. On this episode of All About Fitness, it's a lot of fun to catch up. And he really is. He's one of the smartest guys I've known in the industry for a long time. He's still relatively young. And it is so much fun to see how he's changing the game in terms of talking about exercise and its effect on the mind. Ryan Glatt is returning to talk about how you can exercise to improve the strength and the health of your brain. If you're looking for a versatile product that can help you stay in shape, whether you're at home, at work, or on the road, then go to hyperware.com and check out Soft Bells and Sand Bells. Sand Bells are neoprene discs. They're filled with sand. They're like medicine balls except they don't roll. That's one of the reasons why I love them. They're great for home use because you set it down. You don't need to worry about it rolling away like you do a round ball. I'm such a huge fan of sandbells that I use them in my book, Smarter Workouts, The Science of Exercise Made Simple, because they are the perfect tool for strength training, mobility training, and metabolic conditioning. Use code AAF10, AAF10 to save 10% on the purchase of sandbells and softbells. You can go to hyperware.com. H-Y-P-E-R, wear.com. Check out the link in the show notes and you'll see all the products at Sandbells, Softbells, and the Vest, all the products that Hyperware has to offer, and you can save 10% on your next purchase. Well, it's funny you say that, Ryan, because as you're saying this, I, I'm thinking, you know, when, I always joke that nobody walks into the gym to say I'm going to train my fascia today or nobody walks in today to say I'm going to train my hormones, my endocrine system today. And, and right. I don't think very many people 
go to the gym specifically thinking about cognitive development. Now, the first question I want to ask, so you're starting to see more people come into your clinic becoming concerned about a, a potential cognitive decline, meaning they're not reacting to something they've experienced, but they're looking to head off. Is that something that you're starting to see from the general yeah. population? And, and how old? Like, how old are these people coming in? Yeah, I mean, let's use me as an example. I'm 27, and I have attentional issues, you know, impulse control issues. And I've had that my whole life from a head injury, and I know you have that history as well. So cognitive issues are applicable across the lifespan, as are physical ones. Um, but, I mean, we have people you know, from mid thirties to 75 with no specific cognitive issues coming in to be screened and diagnosed. Now, a majority of our population that we see here at the Pacific Brain Health Center are primarily people with a subjective memory complaint, meaning they've mm -hmm. noticed that their memory is slipping or they've noticed a significant other's memory is slipping and they bring them in. Uh, or it's people that aren't sure what's going on with their brains and bodies. And, you know, they come in to get and end up getting diagnosed with uh, mild cognitive impairments uh, or dementia, uh, maybe a certain subtype of dementia, hopefully early dementia so we can do more about it, uh, or even Parkinson's combined with dementia. And so there's, uh, I, I think it, there's three primary groups. There's what I call the worried well, which is the population that you're talking about. No one who has a particular issue, but they're worried about their brain health and want to know more about it, understand their brain structure and function and overall brain health, um, and identify the risk factors and create a plan to mitigate those risk factors. Then we have people who are more early stage mild cognitive impairments, which are individuals who aren't quite demented. Uh, but they're starting to see a decline in cognition, which is normal. It's normal to decline uh, in cognitive abilities as it is with the body over time. And we know that we can implement exercise programs to be preventative of the physical decline, but not a lot of people create these integrative health plans to mitigate the risk or acceleration of cognitive decline. And so it does kind of run that gambit, if that makes sense. Well, the, what fascinates me, and I'm just thinking about this because you're absolutely right, and, and I'm kind of – as I'm listening to you, Ryan, I'm like going, why have we not done this before? Because people do right. come into a fitness center. I want to lose weight. Okay. Well, we got people that can focus on exercise for weight loss. You know, mm -hmm. I want to get big. I want to add muscle. We, we know, we know the type of exercises that can focus on that. I want to get quick. I want to build my endurance. We've identified that. How does exercise affect the brain? I mean, how does, can exercise slow down the development of, of, of you know, of, of Alzheimer's or dementia? or Parkinson's, you know, how closely related is it between exercise and our cognitive health? It's quite closely related. And so, um, I mean, as we've talked about before, Pete, there is a extremely high value to exercise and brain health. And that's my uh, favorite modality to recommend because people just aren't specific with it or they don't think it's valuable to remain as active as possible. In addition, it's not just about staying active. You know, if you're running five times a week, because a majority of the research shows aerobic exercise creates new brain cells, increases angiogenesis, new blood vessels, increases the strength and provision of synaptic plasticity and connection uh, between synapses and neurons. Um, all of that is valid and true, but a lot of people hear that and say, oh, I'll just run as much as I can. But, you know, per our friends at the Institute of Motion, we know that a majority of the science points to optimal health having to do with structured variability. And so that's kind of my approach is we want to identify aerobic uh, coordinate, aerobic tr uh, training programs, coordination programs, resistance training programs. We want a structured variety of all those things. And because the brain adapts just like the body, we want to keep uh, the brain guessing. And, you know, uh, inappropriately used term is muscle confusion. But if we just roll with that, let's talk about keeping the body and brain uh, confused, if you will, so that it has to adapt to new stimuli and stressors. And I think, you know, without going too deep into it, that's sort of the strategy. Now, the um, the acute variables and the fine tuning and the personalization of all that, that's where uh, we need to bring in education to educate these health and fitness professionals on what that requires, what's a proper intake process for assessing cognitive health within the scope of the health and fitness professional. And when you have that intake process based on your results, what do you do? And so, you know, we are trying to create that as well. So you're trying to create a whole, just like Greg Cook created a system for a movement screen with a functional movement screen, you're creating a system for how do you assess, identify screen, you know, for cognitive yeah. function and how can you, that, that's essentially you, what you're doing, yeah, right? Exactly. Is how do you screen I mean, and how do you address it? Yeah, and neuroscience can be very intimidating and complex, and so we want to simplify it for health and fitness professionals. Um, so if we just look at the three primary categories of memory, 
attention and processing. And processing includes information processing, the speed of processing. Attention could be uh, sustained attention over one, you know, uh, focus of attention over time or uh, switching attention between stimuli or dual tasking, being able to manage one cognitive and one physical activity at the same time or multitasking for lack of a better phrase. Um, and memory, what kind of memory, short-term, long-term, verbal, visual memory. Um, and, you know, the research is out there of, you know, what Tai Chi, martial arts, cardiovascular exercise, sports exercises, meditation, mindfulness, sleep, all these things that have outcomes on these different cognitive abilities and physical brain structures, we just need to connect the dots. So yeah, we're working on and very close to finishing uh, an intake process that's within the scope, a model for collaborating with physicians, neurologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists, psychologists uh, within the health and fitness professional realm. And then to be able to prescribe exercises uh, and exercise modalities, frequencies, durations, intensities, variabilities, et cetera, to facilitate brain health. and. While, yes, by partnering with physicians, you can actually get brain scans and cognitive testing and the like, um, you know, it, it's just even taking a guess or a shot in the dark is better than what we're doing now. That That's fascinating, Ryan. And when I'm going to take a couple steps back here for listeners. And I want to ask the first thing, we, we talked about variability, and we're, we're going to go into variability in a second, because I think it's important for people to understand that concept. I know we've talked about that previously in our previous podcast. But I'm going to come back to variability in one second. But the, the first thing I'm going to ask is muscle confusion. Because I know, yeah. I kind of giggle, you, for listeners, Ryan is one of the most cerebral guys I know. He's very thoughtful, very intent. And, and you know, the geeks like us really like to use proper terminology. We like to use the term periodization. So muscle confusion, I know, how do you feel? As somebody that does this on a really high level, obviously, how do you feel about using an over popularized or an over glamorized or nonsense term like muscle confusion? Because I've kind of come to the, to, to the, the conclusion, I need to accept it, not fight it, but at least explain to people to what, what muscle confusion or muscle tone, at least what the technical thing is. So how have you kind of reconciled that using those yeah. terms with your background in education? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it comes down to the client or the patient that we're educating at the end of the day. I mean, we can debate all we want, but, you know, I can explain the, you know, physiological adaptation mechanisms that are really behind it, but I don't want to lose that patient or client. So when I have a patient in front of me, um, you know, I ask them, have you heard of muscle confusion? They're like, yeah. I'm like, well, we want to use structured variability to kind of get a similar mechanism. And I don't need to explain the science to them because, one, I have limited time and maybe they don't care. But if they understand the concept, then it changes their behavior. And if they have the principle in their head that doing something variably or mixing it up, if you will, is a good thing for brain health and physical health, which it is, then we don't really need to explain the science. So as long as they understand it, and you know, some of these people are more detail-oriented and they want to know the mechanisms, then I'll go there. And you and I both know the mechanisms. Um, and you know, it's really providing novel stimulus so that the body and brain can adapt. It's that simple, and we don't need to make it any harder than that. Well, and that's one thing I think it's important for people to understand. So I'm going to stay here for a second on variability, because I think there are a lot of people out there, Ryan, and you just mentioned you talked to somebody who does running, who jogs. There are a lot of people out there who think, well, I would exercise... 30, 40 minutes a day. I do my regular activity. I do this. but And this is such a, a tricky road we walk down because on one hand, we say, be more active, be more active, be more active. And there are people out there that say, well, I exercise every day. Yet now we're telling them you shouldn't be doing the same thing every day or you shouldn't be doing the same thing every time. So I have a little bit of empathy for these people who say like, wait, what? What do you, you know, because they get into a routine where maybe they, they walk the same path or they do the right. same workout. They use the same machines. So at least they're exercising. But could doing that same routine for an extended period of time, could that, have, could that work against you? And could specifically that work against your cognitive health? Why is it important for your cognitive, for your brain, for your body to be doing different movements? Yeah, it's an interesting conversation. And I think this is the role of the personal trainer and the health coach or health professional. Uh, that's, this is where they can come in and take care of all these nuances by understanding them. But I would say that you, know, you don't want to disrupt someone's routine because – there's, you know, research showing that overall fitness levels and staying active does contribute to brain health. That should be the foundation. If they have a routine that's the same thing, but they're consistent, that's important. And so once they have that, we want to just lightly, 
you know, it depends on their motivation and their willingness to change for sure. But we want to lightly recommend that adding something novel. So if they're just doing cardiovascular exercise, let's throw in something coordinative. And they're like, what do you mean by coordinative? And I say, well, it could be dance, tai chi, tennis. And they say, oh, I used to play tennis. I love tennis. Like, great. When's the last time you played tennis? And they say 10 years ago. I say, great. Are, can you find a tennis pro? Are you near a court? Oh, absolutely. Can you do it twice a week? Can you get with a coach? And I know your knees might be bad or something because I'm working with usually people with osteoarthritis or some sort of you know age-related musculoskeletal or physiological condition. And so we have to be considerate of that. And they say, oh, sure, I'd love to do that. And so they get into it. And so by lightly recommending a change to their routine or an addition – that they actually end up enjoying, they're going to be okay with that. But a lot of people stick to routine because of uncertainty or they think that you know just staying active will contribute to brain health and body health, which it will. We don't want them to stop the routine, but if they're willing to keep up with the frequency of how often they're performing ex- structured exercise or physical activity, then we can modify it slightly or increase the duration or frequency or intensity or modality then I think we can have success, if that makes sense. Well, I, no, and when I'm, I'm, I have a big smile on my face right now, Ryan. And for listeners, we're, we're recording via Skype, but we're just using audio. I have a big smile on my face because you're talking about, I mean, right now you identify primarily, and this goes to something I posted on social media the other day, but right now you identify primarily as a personal trainer. But hearing you talk and, and hearing you use reference to the term health coach and hearing the, the type of work that, that, that you do, Ryan, are we starting to see a shift in our society or a shift in our, I guess not society, but a shift in our industry of where personal trainers are taking that extra step to help people by becoming a health coach? And what's that mean? I mean, what do you, how would you describe the benefits or the differences between working with a trainer and working with a health coach? Yeah, well, I think we are seeing a shift and I think it's great. Um, I think people are hungry for more on the professional education side and people are passionate about learning and they want to do more for their clients and patients. Um, And I think that's fantastic. If you're coming from that place, you're probably part of that transformation in the industry. Um, And I think if you're not a health coach and you want to hyper specialize in one specific aspect of training or vice versa, there's room for collaboration and that's encouraged. And I think what's starting to happen is with the surplus of these very well trained and educated professionals, you don't have to be everything for one person. So yes, I can do this whole brain health coaching thing, but maybe I want to focus on the exercise aspect and not on the nutrition and instead work with a nutritionist that cares about cognition and working with the geriatric population. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, But I would say overall, there is a shift. And I think it means that people are going to get more value and see the health and wellness professional or health and fitness professional as a conduit to various aspects of health. Uh, And I think the applications and the opportunities are very broad and exciting. Well, and and that's really where I think people kind of start thinking about it. Because look, I mean, we understand there's a whole healthcare, health insurance, I don't even want to start going down that path. But to me, it makes so much more sense. And and I really have to credit a trainer I worked with more than a decade ago who said, and his, what he told me, Ryan, is what he tells his clients, he's like, look, you either pay now or you pay later. Meaning you pay a little extra money, you work with a coach, you work with a trainer, they help you, they give you workouts, they guide you through workouts. We know that exercise makes you healthier. So either you pay a little bit of money now to work with a trainer and stay healthy, or you don't, and then you end up getting sick, you end up getting a chronic disease, then you have to pay into the medical system thousands of dollars more to, you know, to, to get unsick. You know, do you, th- I mean, do you think we're at that point in our society where people are starting to realize they need to invest in, in a health coach like yourself to keep them Absolutely. You know, healthy in the first place? Absolutely. But in the case of the uh, Brain Health Center that I work at, a lot of people are unaware it exists. Uh, people are surprised to know something like a brain health coach even exists. They're very uh, they're excited, but they're like, does this exist anywhere else? I say, not really, <laughs> but it could. And then they're saying, well, what's the what's the gap? I said, education. Well, let's and, take a step uh, back. Sorry to cut you off, but take a step back. 40 years ago, the first personal trainers were, you know, you're in Santa Monica. 40 years ago, Ryan, and, and i just connecting the dots, the first yeah. personal trainers were two miles from where you are at Venice Beach. It was all the bodybuilders. And it was like, <laughs> hey, I want to look like you, so let me pay you to help me look like you. So I think we're going to see that where it's like, oh, wait, I can do this with exercise? You mean I can right. help my brain with exercise? So I think we're you're actually kind of, ironically, you're right in the, in the, in the starting <laughs> center of personal training. All you're doing is you're, you're contextualizing in a different avenue. That's right. And, you know, providing some tools and strategies and some education around it. But I didn't think about it like that, Pete. That's uh, maybe it's destiny. Who knows? But, uh, you know, really, I, I think people are excited. In my opinion, 
a lot of the patients and clients I work with are hungry for knowledge and they're looking for guidance and they're looking to be guided towards what they need to do for their brain health. And they don't know that personal trainers can play a role. A lot of them already have personal trainers, but the trainers are just keeping them on a routine and they're not offering a lot of structured variability. And so then I call up their trainers and their trainers, I, I, I ask them, what are their goals? And they're talking about physical goals. And it's because the patients and clients didn't know that they should open the conversation to include cognitive goals and neither did the professional. But if we kind of um, create that environment for people to have that conversation, the relevant programming and recommendations can actually take place. And so then what I'll do is I'll call their personal trainer. I say, hey, look, you're doing a lot of great balance interventions and strengthening so they don't fall and hurt themselves and they can maintain their muscle mass. But this individual is overweight and has metabolic risk factors and blood pressure related risk factors, and that can affect cognition and brain health. Can we actually control for that? And so now I'm seeing a shift and okay, now we recommend they get an exercise bike so they can you know, do some steady state cardiovascular exercise while they watch television. And the program's changing to be more metabolically variable. So it can be, uh, we can get those metabolic variables and, and therefore benefits and in, therefore impact brain health and cognitive function. And so um, that's the sort of conversation that needs to happen. I think people are willing to have it it's just that it needs to happen, <laughs> if that makes sense. And we're going to take a few. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But first, Ryan, we're going to take a brief pause for a word sure. from one of our sponsors. Are you looking for the perfect at-home product that you can use as a bench, a stability ball, a core trainer, and a metabolic conditioning tool? <laughs> well, look no further than TerraCore. It really is. It's one of the most versatile products in the world. People have to understand. I get contacted at least at least once a week. People trying to show me a product, check it out, look at what I've invented. Most of that stuff is nonsense. But when I saw the TerraCore, I knew that it was going to be one of the hottest products out there. And so far, I've been proven right. You can go to Instagram, check out the feed on Instagram, TerraCore Fitness on Instagram. That's T-E-R-R-A, Core Fitness on Instagram. And check out TerraCoreFitness.com. I'm going to have the link below in the show notes. And you'll be amazed at all the different exercises you can do on the TerraCore. Go to TerraCoreFitness.com, use code AAF10, and save 10% on the purchase of a TerraCore. All right, we're back. And so, Ryan, you're talking about helping people exercise for brain health. How do you do that? Are there specific type of equipment, exercise, or can anything be used to, to kind of enhance, to use exercise to enhance the brain? Yeah, so there's low-tech ways of doing it, and there's high-tech ways of doing it. We tend to consider ourselves leaders in this type of intervention. So, of course, we're using some high tech. Uh, we, use some, we use cognitive training technologies that provide visual and or audible input um, that allows some sort of interaction, um, some sort of cognitive load to the individual. And all we're making them do is exercise while they're interacting with that cognitive stimulus, primarily a visual or audible cognitive stimulus. Um, you know, some of those technologies include SmartFit, FitLite, NeuroTracker, interactive metronome. Those are some technologies you can Google and check out. But then we're also using basic things like different colored balls and hurdles and different colored dots and uh, vipers and agility ladders and cones. And we're creating um, task-based exercise uh, in, or I am creating audible or visual cues or one of our trainers are to provide that cognitive load. Uh, one very rudimentary way of thinking about it is sports offer a cognitive and physical load. And typically with the geriatric population that is having a cognitive complaint or presenting with a cognitive complaint, they're most likely not playing sports. And if they are, it's when they played for a while and they're adapted. So introducing things like boxing or, uh, uh, you know, stick fighting like Kali or dance or Tai Chi, all these elements that have coordinative or motor learning or skill learning aspects to it, or even elements of sport like, you know, playing basketball while doing some sort of functional movement uh, or just dribbling a basketball um, or throwing a baseball back and forth, it makes them feel youthful and introduce a play, but it also provides a cognitive load. So it can also be that simple, but absolutely we're using technology, um, one from the intervention standpoint to provide that cognitive stimulus. But in our clinic, we also use uh, technology that's within you know the hospital system, things like volumetric MRIs to see the uh, actual structural size of various aspects of the brain, like the hippocampus or the amygdala. We're using computerized cognitive testing. So it's computerized assessments to measure things like attention, memory, cognitive flexibility, et cetera. We're also using something called quantitative EEG, which is sort of like a swim cap that we inject gel into, and it can look at brain activity patterns. And then we're also using apps uh, for health coaching, for fitness tracking, for 
cognitive training, for uh, delivering fitness interventions. Um, we're even having people wear uh, this thing called emotive, which is a little think it's almost like a EEG headset that picks up brain activity that we can measure while you're moving to measure your attention, your engagement. We can see when people have stopped paying attention or they're too stressed by a certain stimulus. And so we manage that. So we love using technology. Um, we use technology for assessing balance and we you know, have people stand on a balance plate and do some feedback with postural sway and balance and body awareness. We use uh, technology for delivering mindfulness and breathing interventions. We have uh, technology for delivering uh, sound-based interventions. We use something called integrative listening systems that um, provides a certain frequency of sound to help vi- uh, regulate vagal tone. Well, hold on. Um, if, I, if, I can, if I can interrupt you, yeah, I was just saying, if I can pause, break in there for a second, because you know, I'm kind of, you're sitting here talking about audio tones, which is fascinating, but I just, it, listening to you talk, it kind of occurs to me, we have low tech technology and we have we high tech technology. So I think of low tech technology like balls or medicine balls or colored dots. We, that's very prevalent in the gym now. Is there a benefit of low tech technology in terms Absolutely. of training? And, and, and what is that? Absolutely. So if you Wikipedia technology, I think the first paragraph, they use a spoon as an example of technology. And if you think of a spoon, I mean, there's actually spoons with technology in them, uh, which is, I think, is amazing. But if you just look at a spoon, you know, you wouldn't consider a spoon high tech, right? Um, But I would say that if we look at how evolution occurred, I I often explain why cognitive and physical training combined makes sense is because when we hunted the antelope, we had to run, we had to have power, we had to have endurance, we had to have balance, but we also need to react. We need to make decisions. We need to control impulses, use our hand-eye coordination skills. So we're, we're finding that areas of the brain that are meant for cognition are also meant for movement, and areas of the brain that we thought were just for movement are also for cognition. And it's not a surprise because that's how we evolved. But we also evolved with and because of technology things like spoons and spears and these tools. And so I think it's interesting that a lot of the research shows a benefit to uh, using tools and learning skills, uh, you know, music therapy and art therapy and using these sports like implements for cognitive and physical training. It's actually quite natural when we think about it. And so I think that low tech is not low tech. It is just a type of technology. And so we don't look at hurdles or baseball bats or uh, anything like that as a or a stick even. I mean, uh, if you look up cognitive Kali, um, there's a guy named Paul McCarthy who is actually a martial arts instructor. He runs some UCLA programs uh, for martial arts, and he uses stick fighting as a way of training cognition in athletes and people who are neurologically prone uh, or at risk. And so I think it's amazing. We can use something as simple as a stick to train the brain and body very intensively and very effectively. Um, so I wouldn't even call it low tech. I would just say it's not using electronics. Um, and then, of course, we have technology that uses electronics. And I think it runs the gambit. I think they're all extremely useful. I wouldn't say one's better than the other. It's really about how you use them and why you use them. What type of what what do you tend to because you're very thoughtful and you definitely know your your arsenal, your toolbox extremely well in terms of the high tech stuff. What do you find yourself? <clears throat> excuse me. In terms of the high tech stuff. Which which ones do you find yourself using more often? Are there certain apps or certain pieces of equipment, of high-tech equipment, that you find are are your sort of kettlebell or dumbbell, meaning that they're your, your go-to resource for helping somebody develop their cognitive skill? Well, sure. I think um, I certainly have my biases. I think everyone does. I and mean, my biases probably come from my training. And so if I, I haven't done, for example, a strong first certification, but if I did, I use a lot of kettlebell work. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, but what I tend to use uh, is the Viper. I use the Viper quite a lot for cognitive physical training. And I got to give uh, the Institute of Motion and Michelle Dalcourt um, and Sean and Trevor from Genesis Flow for really inspiring me with these applications and providing those tools and strategies, but doing things like movement flows that involve coordination, timing, rhythm, memorizing sequences. We use a lot of that in the clinic, but then we also use a lot of Smart Fit, which is, I mentioned earlier, and you've seen Smart Fit. It's a multi-target uh, board for delivering multi-sensory cognitive training combined with physical training, and they have different technologies for that. Um, I use the, both of those quite a lot. I'd say primarily, but then, you know, our programs 
are also variable. So we try to practice what we preach. We'll switch between the smart fit to a Viper, to a baseball, to a basketball, to a hurdle, to a neuro tracker, cognitive training software on our computer, to, um, you know, just doing some dance or Tai Chi. I mean, we'll switch between these things. And this is how we run our sessions. They're not randomized. They all have a rhyme or a reason to them based on their assessments, cognitively and neurologically, as well as physically. But that, that's sort of how we structure our programs is with structured variability, understanding that all of these tools have value. We want to incorporate them in a sound fashion. You, and you hear you talk about it. It's really fascinating because you seem someone who's very comfortable with technology. And I'm one of these people where I, I can use it, but I, I get intimidated. Do you see that a lot of people – I mean, do you think – when it comes to technology and, and fitness, Ryan, do you think that tech sometimes can be a little intimidating and kind of keep people I, away I from getting involved? Yeah, I do. But if you really look at it in a different light, um, for example, if you want to learn how to use a kettlebell, you probably go through some sort of education. Either you go to a certification course or you study it online or you have someone guide you through it. I think that's pretty normal. And that's for any fitness tool. And that's actually why we have personal training. I think that's why it's STEM is to learn how to use these tools. I don't think technology is any different. There's studies where they show people in their 80s and 90s how to use Uber and or Lyft or something like that so they can increase transport, so they can have social engagement, cognitive engagement, get to physical therapy, get to all their appointments, see their family. And the ones that are successful are the ones that teach them how to use it. And so I don't think technology is any different. Um, I, I really just think that people hear about it and it's there and there's this kind of stereotype around it where, oh, it's complex, it's complicated, it's not for me, or it's millennial. I don't think any of that's true. Once you have some sort of education or onboarding around electronic technology, um, and I think it's easier because usually the resources or tutorials are built into that platform, whatever it is, a software or a hardware, then you can learn it and then you have that skill. Um, so I really don't think that's true. You know, and so that, – because that's one thing that I think people fear is that it's like they, they get in there and they go, oh, wow, that, that overwhelms them. What's your advice um, for people that, that might be looking for – for people that are tech, that, that enjoy tech, that are tech aficionados, what's some of your – what would be your go-to at-home kind of tech, either low-tech or high-tech, that you might add to an, an at-home fitness equipment or at-home fitness um, fitness center? Sure. I mean, a great way to start is just by using apps. And so – um, I mean, I don't want to recommend one specific app, but for, let's just use the example of Headspace or Calm. And a lot of people are, you know, I'm not good at meditation or mindfulness or breathing. I don't know how to get started. And once again, it's not a, something you, you're good at. It's just something that we're recognizing should be part of a health plan. And instead of an exercise plan, I call it a health plan because it allows us to incorporate so many other things. And so you know, of course, there's fitness app exercise like Aptiv or Nike Training or something like that. Yeah, those can be extremely helpful because they provide guidance whether you agree with the exercises or not, and it's better than doing no exercise at all. And so those types of apps are available as well as, you know, these, these mindfulness, meditation, and breathing apps. I think they're highly valuable. And then some sort of nutrition application. If we just have those, and if you want to go there, you know, cognitive training apps, I'm not going to debate it on this um, interview on how effective they are, but they do play a role. Um, things like Brain HQ, for example, um, and they have been shown to have some effectiveness. But I think everyone should have, if you look at the categories or buckets, if you will, of sleep, mindfulness, or stress management, exercise, nutrition, and cognitive stimulation. If you have one in each of those buckets, and if you have apps that cross over into both buckets or more than one bucket at one time, that's great. Um, but you should have all those buckets covered, and that should be the minimum as part of a you know, holistic or integrative health plan for physical and brain health. I think it applies to everybody. And, and no, I think you're right. And when you look at this, I mean, how would you, uh, let me try to think of what, you know, when you look at, at getting people engaged with this and getting people kind of overcoming that technology, how would you describe the benefits of, of high tech? I mean, if you're trying to get me to think about how I would use more technology or add more technology, I mean, you've touched on the benefits quite a bit, I think, to some degree, but in terms of talking about why would we pick up some technology? I mean, what is what is doing something on a computer going to be different than doing something like with reacting to the movement of a ball or the, or the directions of a coach? Yeah, well, specifically in the population that I work with, with people who have, may have trouble getting access or even affording access to certain interventions, um, it really solves a problem. I think all technology is just meant to solve a problem. 
there's a general negative viewpoint about technology, but the reason we created a spoon is because the problem was eating with your hands isn't always effective, although it's very fun, and I recommend everyone tries it. But, um, you know, the reason we created spears and things like this was because, you know, running down the antelope and killing it with your hands probably wasn't effective, so let's make it easier or solve that problem with technology. And so all these apps solve a problem. You know, let's take the example of a meditation app. It's hard to get to a meditation class or it's hard to find a class or maybe too expensive or, you know, locally it's not available or people feel they don't want to be in a uh, uh, you know, public setting. They feel embarrassed or something or they feel like a failure trying to do it. Whatever it is, uh, that, that kind of app would solve that problem. Um, it doesn't mean it takes the place of something, but it's certainly better uh, than not having it at all. And so I think all technology solves a problem. So I think if people take a look outside themselves and say, what are the main problems in my health? For me, I'm, I'm a very ADD type person. I get caught up in all the things I'm busy with. I don't think that's exclusive to me. So one of my favorite pieces of technology is my calendar on my phone. I think I know it sounds trivial, but scheduling time for certain activities is what's you know, what I do best and, or that's where I do best rather. That's when I actually stick to my health plans because knowledge doesn't make a behavior change. A lot of the time it's environment. And I think, uh, you know, Michelle Dalcourt and Bobby Capuccio, our friends there would agree in terms of behavior change is that environment can certainly dictate behavior and technology is now part of our environment. So how can we get technology as our environment to work for us and help us do better. I think that's a great place to start is asking that question. Well, and I didn't even thought about that, Ryan. You're absolutely right. Just getting into making using the tech of your your app or not app, but using the tech of the tech of your calendar app on your phone, if you put it in there a 15 minute walk every morning at eight and you put it in there a 15 minute walk every more afternoon at three, you're using right. technology. And I like that because you're not you're not thinking about it. You have to to change your behavior, you have to take an action. And even Absolutely. just using a low tech thing, and people might not realize that, but you, you are using tech to change behavior. So to yeah. start wrapping it up, what are a couple of things? If, if people are to, to think about cognitive health and, and to think about, okay, I, I want to use exercise to, to really enhance my, you know, my brain power. And I just want to make one comment real quick, just thinking about this. What's interesting to note is you have all this stuff about NFL players. You hear all this stuff about NFL players, head injury. What I find interesting is the ones, the NFL players that stay on TV that are more engaged with the sport, they seem to have really good cognitive recall, you know, 10, 15, 20 years after playing the sport because they're engaged and they're doing things. They look like they're staying relatively active. Yet, when you see some of the players that are having cognitive abilities, it's because they're not doing much. They're not interacting much. How much is a social interaction involved in, you know, where I was going with this is I think the players that are on TV are still around the sport. So they're still engaged in the sport, whereas players that maybe aren't doing media around the sport aren't. How is it, how important is it to stay engaged in a social connectivity for cognitive health? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's hugely valuable. Um, I think there's a lot to go on there. We could go the, the sports route, the concussion route, you know, cognitive performance route. I, I think we'll abstain from that because it's a long conversation. But if I was to speak generally, what is the value of a social slash a cognitive stimulus on a regular basis? It's immense. And if we look at older adults who are severely depressed, which is extremely common, um, they are usually isolated or there's something that they used to do, like uh, cycling with their friends or playing you know, a pickup football game or something like that, that they're no longer doing for either logistical, physical, or cognitive reasons. And it doesn't impact their quality of life in a negative fashion. Um, we need social contact. We're social animals. And social isolation is something that is measured and is correlated with overall mortality. Um, and it is something that we want to look at. And keeping social interaction, I think, is... You know, I don't think it's hard in today's day and age. I think it's easier. I just think people opt for a uh, electronic interaction, which I think can be beneficial, um, instead of a uh, a physical one. And sometimes that means you don't have social, you have less interaction socially overall. Um, at least that's the case for a lot of people. And so, um, I think social contact and interaction is cognitively demanding because you have to <laughs> you have to not say offensive things and you have to explain to what I, I mean if you want to catch up with someone and you haven't caught up with them in a while and you're tired it's hard to do that because you have yeah. to elaborate yeah. on everything that's been going on there's so many cognitive processes involved in socialization it's critical and i think it's a cognitive health related strategy is to 
uh, stay socially active. And some people need ideas. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll use the example of a patient that I recently saw, overweight, had trouble getting active, um, but their grandkids lived about an hour away from them and they lived in Silver Lake. And they say, oh, we see them sometimes. They come to us like, what about if you go to them? And one, you can see them because they desire they want to see them more. It's critically important for multiple generations of the same family to stay in contact for cognitive reasons, but also quality of life reasons and psychological reasons. And I said, what if you went to see them once or twice a week on a regular basis, basis, it's scheduled. And while you saw them, you went around for a walk around the lake. You're getting some activity in. So you're getting all the benefits psychologically, socially, physically, cognitively, mentally, et cetera at the same time. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's immensely valuable. And just like I would recommend, you know, taking a multivitamin, I would recommend social stimulation. Well, and you, but that, that demonstrates right there, Ryan, the role of a coach, because as a coach, you're looking at the bigger picture. So talking to these people and hearing them say, we go to our, you know, we, we go see our relatives. Well, why not take that a step further? I'd love that. That right there demonstrates, you know, kind of the next generation of training or, or where, training coaching is going to going to evolve to but i started going down there for that last question to, to wrap it up what could people start doing today in their home that could be some sort of cognitive exercise meaning if i get home and i'm like okay i, or I you're listening to this in the car i get back to my to my house or my apartment i want to do some sort of exercise today to to boost my cognition what's the easiest way for people to get started mm. i think the uh it, it's a really great question um, and I think it depends on where you are. So let's say you're an individual that maybe exercises a couple times a week. What are the lowest hanging fruit opportunities for you to increase your frequency of exercise at least by one to two days? And if you can ask yourself that question, maybe technology can play a role in helping you do that. Maybe you have to you know, enroll in a class or hire a trainer to keep you accountable. That would be one start is how can we increase the frequency? If you think you're exercising you know, three to five times a week, and you're doing it consistently. The next question would be, how can we integrate variability? Is there something that I can add, change, or modify to impose a new cognitive and or physical challenge onto myself? Um, and I think if you're already doing that, how often are you doing that? Are you doing it once a year? Are you doing it four to six, you know, every four to six weeks? Um, you know, how often are you periodizing that variability? And then the next question would be, if that's you know, if that last step is too much, it's a little too nuanced or detailed, maybe a step before that would be, can I incorporate other aspects of brain health using technology such as mindfulness, meditation, sleep tracking, uh, nutrition? Uh, w where are the opportunities? Or maybe cognitive stimulation, social stimulation. What can I do that I'm not doing enough of um, that can supply me a cognitive benefit or, or allow me to sequester a cognitive benefit from those activities or interventions? So those are the questions I would ask. That's, I mean, and that's that's killer detail to ask. And, and for listeners, you have to understand, when you work with somebody like Ryan or, or sometimes with somebody with, with the background that we have, you're going to get a lot more. You're not going to you're not going to a health club. You're not going to a fitness center to you know to to rip your abs or to whatever blast your butt. You're going to go there and get a lot more out of it than you ever even thought was possible. Now you do a lot of great content on your Instagram page, Ryan, yeah. how can people listen, people listening go, man, this sounds awesome. I want to learn more about this. How can people kind of engage with you and learn more about what you're doing? What's the, what, yeah. What's the, the name of, way, sorry. What's the name yeah, of your, what's the name of your place in Santa Monica and, and where can people learn more about it? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give a couple of websites. Uh, the brain health center uh, in Santa Monica is called the Pacific brain health center. And it's part of the Pacific neuroscience Institute. Um, which is built in association with Providence Health, St. Joseph's Hospital in Santa Monica, as well as the John Wayne Cancer Institute. Uh, if you Google any of that, it'll show up. Or you can go to pacificbrainhealth.org. Um, and I strongly encourage anyone to you know, make a consultation or appointment. We primarily take insurance, so we're not really this you know, one of those cash pay clinics that are trying to make a quick buck. We take a lot of insurance. So if you or your, you know, uh, anyone in your family or friends feels like they should be screened for uh, cognitive decline related issues or concerns, I strongly recommend it. And Pete, I just want to say that there is an issue of people not getting screened early enough. If people got screened for cognitive decline related issues and diseases early, it would save the U.S. alone $1 trillion per year if, if just early detection was more in place. And so I got to encourage everyone to do that. 
And so the Pacific Brain Health Center does take various types of insurance. Uh, so I'd strongly recommend people to check it out. Um, if you're looking for uh, to stay up to date with the course that we have coming out in a couple months, uh, training health and wellness professionals how to incorporate uh, brain health related exercise programs and health programs, including this uh, intake process that we talked about. Um, into their practice and into their expertise, I would recommend going to ryanglatt.com. And then there's a quick little sign up link there and you'll stay posted. Um, and then my Instagram handle is glatt, G L A T T, dot somatic, S O M A T I Q. Man, you're doing awesome work, Ryan. And, and as usual, I really appreciate, uh, appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you, Pete. Thanks for what you're doing as well. Love it. All right, before we go any further, I want to t thank Ryan for taking the time uh, for the interview. And for listeners, you can tell this is one of those this is one of those episodes where I kind of geek out. This I'm doing a series right now. There's been a few episodes on technology, on how technology is impacting fitness. And what I really like about this conversation, when we recorded it, to sit there and think that the spoon and a spear, that at one point that was cutting edge technology. I mean, that's why I interviewed Chris Frankel from TRX, right? Because the TRX is relatively simple technology, but it changes the way that we use our body. And we don't think of exercise as having an impact on the brain. You know, majority, 98 point, probably 99.99% of all exercise literature is focused on other things. Yet none of us are getting any younger, right? <laughs> We're all getting a little bit older. So how do we maintain our cognitive health? Because guess what? Watching TV and playing Fortnite ain't doing it. You know, getting out there and engaging with people, learning new things. You know, I'm going to have a link below to the Viper Pro. You know, you've heard us talk about the Viper Pro. And that really is, it's a relatively low-tech fitness tool, but you can do so many things with it that it can work on motor skill, it can work on strength, it works on mobility. But the whole idea of having to use a tool that you're not used to, to learn new movement patterns and to sequence and flow and connect different movement patterns you want to talk about cognitive development, wow. You know, you have the Viper Pro, you have the Mace, you have Indian Clubs. All these are tools that can strengthen our body, but because they require coordination and dexterity, they're strengthening our mind as well. Now, I love strength machines. I love weight training machines because they're one of the most effective ways to train. But when you look at a weight training machine, you most of the time you're sitting down and you're not putting load. You're not putting, well, you're putting load into the body, but you're not putting load from multiple directions and variable, you're not putting variable loads into the body. So machines are good for making you strong, but if you want to make your entire body strong, if you want to work on linking your mind, your body, your fascia, your muscle, everything you hear talked about on this podcast, we have to get up and we have to do things different. Grab a mace, grab some Indian clubs, grab a Viper Pro. Look for different ways to do things. It's not just about using our muscles. It's about moving. Our body is designed to move. The more we move, the more we involve our brain. The more we involve the brain, the smarter you become. Or, at the very least, we reduce the risk of developing dementia. That's one of the things that we know. That's one of the things that we're finding. You know, People like Ryan and people in this field of neuroscience and neurocognitive development working on exercise, they're seeing that people with traumatic brain injury are gaining back motor control by practicing it. So it doesn't matter what happens to your body. It doesn't matter how it feels. You can change your body. You can change your fitness. You can change your strength. You can change your cardiorespiratory. You can change how smart you are via exercise. Now, if I told you there's a pill for all this, I'd probably charge you $1,500 a pill. But guess what? All you got to do is get up, go out, move, sweat, dance, walk, run, climb, roll on the ground. It does not matter. For people that listen to this podcast regularly, you're hearing a constant theme. Just get up and move. Find something you enjoy and go out there and do it. If you need some ideas, that's why I wrote my book, Smarter Workouts. There's a plug for you. <laughs> I don't charge anything on this podcast, but I am trying to sell my book. So you got to put up with that. Check out the link in the show notes, Smarter Workouts. I honestly, I wrote it because I want to give you the skills to move better. Everything in there teaches you how to move. It's exercise is a function of movement. Honestly, I wrote one of the first weight loss books. I don't talk about weight. Or I, sorry. I wrote one of the first exercise books where I don't talk about weight loss. It's not that important. What is important is that you learn how to move and you learn how to use your body. We only have one body, folks. It has to last us for a lifetime. I know I'm gonna, mine's going to last me a long time because I'm taking care of it well. And all I'm trying to do with this podcast, all I'm trying to do with Smarter Workouts and the content I put out there is trying to give you the tools 
so that you know how to make your body last as long as you want it to. Thanks for stopping by this episode of All About Fitness. If you want to connect with me, you can reach me at the All About Fitness Podcast. That's All About Fitness Podcast at gmail.com. That's the email, All About Fitness Podcast at gmail.com. You can ping me or connect with me on Instagram, Pete McCall underscore fitness on Instagram. That's Pete McCall underscore fitness on Instagram. And that's Pete MC underscore fitness on Twitter. Thanks for stopping by, and I'm definitely looking forward to have you join me for future episodes of All About Fitness.